Okay, now, so for those of you in the room who are not from Rackspace, <laughs> yay! <laughs> Five people, yay. We have the wonderful Matt here who has taken time away from his family on the coast of New South Wales, left his young family there in order to talk to us about this Rackspace stuff. Is everyone here? Yep, good. Um, so when I talk, I tend to wander but I've got a sore foot, so I'm not sure how this is going to work. I do have my chair, um, and if I sit down, I'm not trying to be unprofessional. I don't know, whatever. Rude. Rude, rude, I don't want to be rude. Okay, anyway, um, like the announcement said, uh, my name's Matthew Oliver, and I'm talking about challenges when scaling, continued adventures in Swiss sharding. So, as you can see in that title, as a continued there, that's because this is a continuation. I know that's crazy, that's rocket science for you guys, but um, last year, in Geelong, I gave a presentation, very similar to this one, uh, where I'll go into more details on what I mean by sharding. But uh, last year I said, I did three proof of concepts, and I said, this last one, it's awesome, it's gonna solve Swift's sharding issues. Um, it's this scaling problem in, in general. And here I am next year, which means it didn't solve it. In fact, it's now continued for another year. But I promise you this time, for sure, I have solved it. <laughs> Until, if you see my name next year, I'm sorry again. So, let's see. Uh, who am I? I obviously work at Rackspace, because you can all tell that now. And the big Rackspace everywhere probably gives it away. Um, I'm an OpenStack Swift developer, and I've been attending LCA for quite a while now. Um, started always back there and too shy to talk, um, believe it or not. Uh, go on, move on. So, this is the overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, when I say an overview of Swift, it's not really going to be an overview. Uh, Swift's too awesome and, too com and there's lots of cool things about Swift I could talk about that I'm not going to talk about. In fact, all I'm really going to talk about is some of the bare essentials you need to know so you can follow along. Uh, I don't know if everyone here how familiar people are with Swift. It's an object storage system. There you go. That's probably what, most of you, that's probably what you need to know about. Um, but there will be some parts I'm going to talk very briefly over about Swift because once I try and define the problem description and I start talking about proof of concepts, you know, I want you to follow along. So, uh, I'll then go on the journey so far section there, proof of concepts one to three. That is kind of what I talked about last year. So I'm obviously not going to spend any time on them at all except for a very brief overview so you can follow along on the journey. Um, we'll get to proof of concept four, which is why proof of concept three failed, obviously, and proof of concept four is how we're moving around it. Um, and then I found another, another scaling issue, which I'll then talk about, and that'll be Proof of Concept 5. Proof of Concept 5 is where I'm at now, uh, and it's the answer. Um, yeah, uh, so if you get anything else from this talk, uh, scale things at, uh, testing things at scale is really, really useful, um, even if it takes two years of your life away. So, a swift overview, this is very basic. I used this one last year, it just because my brain, I like to conceptualize things. This is not how Swift works, but it's how my brain kind of sees stuff. So in uh, Swift, you've got three main resources. You've got, I can see it here, why am I looking behind me? Sorry. Um, we've got an account, we've got the container, and we've got objects. Everyone knows object storage tends to be the objects are the data we're storing, so objects are an easy way, place to start. Uh, we store metadata with the objects, but really it's the data we're storing. Uh, containers kind of conceptualize, wrap up these objects uh, into, you know, nice ways. So we could, so annoyingly in Swift, we call them, not annoyingly, we had it first. So we said containers would, would put objects in, and now containers have become a buzzword. So I'm not talking about we're using Docker to do any of this stuff. It's just like a S3, Amazon S3 bucket idea. Um, but the, the uh, container level, it conceptualizes a group of objects, in essence. Um, a place where you can put objects, but it's really storing metadata. So it's storing metadata, uh, user-level metadata at that level, some system metadata, it stores some statistics at the container level, and in this context, more importantly, it's storing a list of the objects that belong to that container. And the account layer is exactly the same, except it stores a list of containers and metadata and whatnot. Uh, 
So if I'm talking, and I'll randomly go off on side shoots probably, and I apologize in advance, uh, but if I ever use the term metadata layer, I'm talking about that kind of contain, uh, count and container level. Further, um, when I'm talking about shifting data and, and, um, and sharding this contain these containers, and I talk about moving object data, we're not moving any of the actual objects. We're moving this metadata around, this listing of what belongs in this container. Anyway, uh, briefly, this is kind of Swift uses a REST API, so that's me reaching in to try and get example.png, which would be the object, out of the LCA 2017 container using the authmat account. So there you go. Uh, next step, very briefly about topology. This just helps define the problem description for you. Um, it's not going to tell you all the amazing things that Swift can do and how you scale things for different workloads. But in essence, this is a very a million mile view of like a Swift cluster. So on your, let me figure this out, on your left, because if you look at my talk last year, I got that wrong. Um, because it turns out knowing lefts and rights and rotating in your head is hard. Um, so on your left, we've got our users, our clients. These clients could be apps, obviously. Could be open, other OpenStack services that want to talk to Swift. It could be anything. We've got our proxy layer, which is like the gateway into the, into the uh, Swift cluster. And then we've got our bunch of storage nodes. Um, the Swift proxies, if you've got a workload that is, uh, has huge connections, you know, it leads all those connections to get to the cluster, you can just scale the proxy layer, or obviously scale the storage layers you need. So it's really flexible. So now we'll zoom down into my, this is my awesome diagramming, you're welcome. Um, you can tell I'm a developer and not a graphic designer. Uh, I found some hard disks online and I've shoved them in boxes. So. We're now, we're now zooming in and we're looking at, say, the storage nodes. In this case, obviously, I've just drawn six storage nodes. Storage, uh, storage nodes are really just servers with a bunch of disks thrown at them. Um, the store, the, there's kind of different elements to, uh, to the Swift storage nodes. Uh, you have uh, object server, container server, mainly, really, and uh, an account server, I think, I found a while ago, three servers. And um, they all talk rest behind the scenes. I only mentioned that because later on I'll be talking about the container server a bit, and I want you to know that I've said something about it. Um, but anyway, when you define these things, uh, these disks, uh, you can arrange them any way you want. So you could say have a couple of storage nodes that are for just your containers, it's a couple of storage nodes for your objects, you know, you can mix and match all you want, or you can put them all in one box. Uh, they can all share the same disks. So in other words, you can use Swift from a, just one box with a few drives if you really want to, it's not very durable, but you know what, what yeah, do what you want. Um, or you can scale up, and Swift will try and keep things dispersed. It goes then one step further. You can define zones, availability uh, zones uh, in Swift. So say you wanted to rack those two servers per rack, you could say a rack is a zone, and then put that into Swift. And you go one, you're going to go one step further again and use regions, and they could be a different room in your data center, different data centers, or a global region cluster. Um, but what really happens it's when we say we go and put an object or something into Swift. Uh, the proxy will get the request from the user. It'll look up on the Swift ring, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, find where it should be, uh, where it should live on the Swift cluster. Uh, what will actually find? So this would look like it's sending three out. So we're using three times replication here, and you'll note that it's picking different di different drives in different zones and different servers. So we're trying to keep it as dispersed as possible. Uh, another thing I might bring up in while I'm talking is, in this case, those three drives on those three servers, we would call in Swift our uh, primary nodes. So they're the nodes that are responsible for keeping that object and keeping it durable. Because um, I'll probably say primary nodes at some point. Uh, anyway, this scales really well. Uh, we've got really very large Swift clusters. Uh, so well, in fact, that we do the exact same thing for a metadata layer. So containers and accounts, they're actually just SQL-like databases that then get replicated through the system pretty much exactly like this. But that kind of leads us to our problem. Uh, what happens when SQLite, SQLite gets too big for us to, uh, to deal with? So we all know the problems with large files, right? Uh, if the file starts getting too large, uh, and we've got, we need to keep updating that database or that file. We start doing a lot more write locks, and latency starts increasing on these servers. Um, and that kind of, and that kind of uh, snowballs. So um, 
when you're putting an object into Swift, it'll go drop it on the disk and then send a request up to the container server as using REST to let you know to update that container listing. And if this is a busy or high latency, there's a, high, a lot of load because of all this locking going on on the, on the SQL app file, then that request can time out or won't make it. And so that is fine. Swift handles that. We, uh, we write it to disk on the, on the object server. And, we, and then we have another backend system called the object updater, which will then make sure it does eventually get into container listing. But it means when we have containers, larger containers, sometimes there's even more, t uh, more latency before uh, it yeah, takes longer for the, the object to appear in the container listing, which can be a bit of a pain to users. Um, they can still access the object. They know the object name. They can still get it out. It's actually not lost at all. So, so we, anyway, we've got this kind of creeping effect. Backend replication has issues too, because we're moving larger files around, and there's locking as we're trying to sync some of these disks together, because they're replicated and getting updated at different times. Anyway. So how do we deal with that? Well, obviously, we need to shard the container up. We need to break it up into smaller bits and share it across the cluster. And that's what this whole thing is all about. So now we move on to the journey so far. So I call this a recap from Act 1, because I'm calling this Act 2. Um, and Act 3 will be next year. So please come along. Um, the first one was object caching. So the way Swift currently, uh, how Swift actually uh, What's the word? Uh, distributes, its, uh, lo uh, distributes the objects across nice and cleanly across the whole cluster is we, we, um, we hash the path that it comes in on. And so this is kind of dog fooding the same idea. We only need to worry about the object part of it component because it's, we're already in the container. Um, this worked as well. It was the first attempt. It worked really well, except I failed to think about all the use cases that we currently support for Swift. So. Uh, Currently, when you get a container listing or an object listing from Swift, you'll get it back in byte order listing. And you'll do that because you're really just asking the SQLite database what to come back. But users expect this now. That this, is what, this is what expected. There's another step to it. When we're sharding containers, we want to keep that completely separate from all our users. So a user who has a container in their account they don't want to suddenly see more containers. They don't want it to it change its behavior. They just want to continue seeing that, that one thing, and we're going to do it all under the hood. So if we suddenly um, start changing the way that order happens, and the order will, hap will change, because instead of using the object names themselves as a byte order listing, now we're applying a hash to it, which will then go find which shard container. It's just another little database to put it in. Uh, when we do want to try and get all these objects back out, all these object names back out, they actually come back in a different order. We could go get all of them and then try and sync them. But that's a lot of RAM, and that's stupid, because uh, we obviously have very large databases that we're trying to solve here. So no, that didn't work. So next, we tried to find um, a data structure capable of storing in byte order, and we used distributed prefix trees. Uh, that worked pretty well, because it, uh, it's kind of adaptable. So if you change a usage pattern, it'll start continue sharding down how you use that container. That was really awesome. So it turns out when you're in a, when you've got a very, uh, so it works well at small to medium scale. But if you get to the, get to the point where you're on a very large cluster, it turns out every, for every uh, like listing request, a get request, uh, you don't want that to turn into a lot, of, lot more requests behind the scenes. And this thing to build up your list, return your listing on a very large container, well sharded, will actually cause a lot more requests than uh, operators would root like. Well, that's, that's the feedback we got. Um, so that wasn't good. Uh, obviously, any time we're sharding, we're going to introduce a few more requests. This one was just a bit overkill. I think a little over-engineered. We've all seen that, right? So the next attempt was to do, I, I'm really bad at names. And so you'll see me use stupid names. People are like, oh, new idea, new idea, quickly. What do I call that thing? So I kept this name, changed names all the time. But really, it's like a binary tree. So I don't know why I just called that. But uh, it's kind of like, Pivot points. The idea is you, we want to simplify the last data structure um, so it's less requests. So if we just always split the middle, all the leaves will always appear in, all the objects will appear in the leaves of the tree. Um, in fact, we don't need the intermediary ones and we can flatten, which we do. Um, so it ends up being more like um, a set of encyclopedias, uh, a set of ranges. Um, but, and the root container, which I'll explain all this. I may actually explain this now. So 
this is a diagram. This concept will come up in all my slides all the time. Uh, like I was mentioning before, the user will have, say, that slash account, A-C-C-T, that is, say, the user's account that he's going to, he or she or them or it is going to see. And um, as we shard, we, they don't want to see all these extra sharding containers because that's kind of ugly. So what we do is put a hidden container, a hidden account uh, that maps directly to that user, so there's no uh, namespace collisions, and uh, that's where we start sharding. The root account, I call the, what I call the root container, is that top node of the tree always, and it's kind of a special one because it's always going to hold references to all the shards that it needs to know about. Anyway, so the idea of this one was to start splitting, and this is kind of where I left you on at the end of the talk last year saying this is awesome. And why this is awesome is because it's really easy to find the middle, to find that pivot point to split. Uh, and there it is. That was the SQL statement that I put in there. I can't remember if it's changed a bit, but uh, that was what it was. And I said, you know what? How easy is this? This is going to be awesome. It turns out that does not scale. It worked well in all my testing because I never scaled high enough. But what tends to happen, oh, the, sorry, okay. so the problem with this SQL statement is that guy, him, this offset thing. He under the hood for SQLite does not scale very well at all. In fact, it's horrible. So what does, uh, what does he do under the hood? So that's not what he does under the hood. That's, how you, that's really badly written slide by me, sorry. So that is how you define limit x offset y, which will then under the hood gets translated to limit x plus y and then discard the first y values. OK, x and y algebra is awesome, but let's move to an example. So I've got an example container um, that was provided by SwiftStack, who generated it for me, which is awesome. Um, it had 700 million rows in the object table, so the object listing. Um, it was, it's, a, I think, 106 gigabytes on disk, so it's a pretty big SQLite file. Um, and that isn't the biggest one we've seen. We've seen ones that are big, too big for disks. So it's pretty big. And, it was, and so what happens there, if we're saying the 700 million, that kind of gets translated to get a limit of one, offset 350 million, which actually translates to limit 350 million and one. Then that returns a, a double link. The result set is a double link list that it then scans from the top and then it goes, throws away all the results until it gets to 350 million and then goes, oh, there's your result. It turns out that doesn't scale well because that grinds to a halt. Um, because we're trying to limit the uh, number of requests we did in, in, in line of a lot of requests through Swift uh, as we're putting an object or whatnot, we tend to grab some container metadata as we go, because we need to know about things. And so I thought, you know what? This is so quick and easy. I'll throw it in there too, so it's easy to come back. And so now I affected almost every request in Swift. And I'm like, man, this thing's slow. Um, so it turns out that doesn't scale, so we can't find the middle anymore, um, unless I don't know, things are other ways. But you can't. I've, I've tried all these different attempts, and there's reasons we can't do stuff. And they'll uh, occur later, if you want to. Anyway, let's, you guys are smarter than me. You might know a better way. Either way, this didn't work. Uh, so proof of, proof of concept four, I call snipping because, again, I don't know how to name things. I was talking to John the other day, and he said, how about slicing? Huh? That would be a great name. Too late. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so it's now called snipping until I push it up into Swift, and then we'll maybe call it slicing in all my documentation, and we'll forget all about this. It won't be on YouTube anymore, right? So anyway, here's, here's that same kind of example. This is how snipping works. Um, if you haven't figured it out in your head already, because it's not that hard. Um, there's our big container. You can tell it's big because it's really long, right? Because again, graphic design is awesome. And, and yeah, that's why, yeah, well, yeah. OK, so big container, we need to find a place to pivot. Instead of searching for the middle, we go X off the end, uh, where we want to start sharding. Um, in all the proof of concepts I've done, it's about a million, 500,000, a million, something like that. And so, and we still use offset for this, because offset's fine at those lower levels. In fact, it's only a couple of milliseconds uh, or less. It's like I don't even notice it on when I'm putting it under benchmarking tests. So anyway, we find, we find a pivot point to pivot on, and then we split him down. See, he's got smaller. See, I even thought about that. Um, maybe way too much time not practicing the talk and uh, playing with um, pictures. Uh, we've created the shard account now. and. I won't bother about how we named that thing and why we named it that, because that's boring. That's a boring story. Um, anyway, then we'll come across and we'll find the next pivot point, and we shard again. And you can imagine we continue doing that until he's fully sharded. And so that's great. We've now skirted around this uh, offset problem that ground to a halt, only to find out 
we've got more problems. So a new scaling issue. So Swift uses, is, uses eventual consistency over immediate consistency because that allows us to scale. Um, but that means uh, at any time, well, in essence, this kind of says there, right? At any point in time, any of these other primary nodes that we want to be sharding could be in any other state. Not just one's sharding and one's not sharding, one could have rows that the other one doesn't have. And because of that, any, any action that we do on any of these databases, we obviously, uh, we obviously need to timestamp. And so at some point in the future, they'll be able to coalesce together and make the right state. That means when we go back up to this guy, as we are doing this shard, he's not really shrinking straight away. We're actually writing a whole, when, when we move a whole bunch of data down to this, or maybe I should have named it better, uh, container DD8, 3, 2, 8, 1, whatever. Um, we, actually, and we have to actually go right to the root container and say, hey, these rows are now deleted because other people might come and try and sync with me and I don't want to go crazy. Um, but one thing that you really don't want to do on a large container, which is why we're trying to do this whole shiny thing in the first place, is to start writing to that, container, uh, that database because, again, that's really slow and that, uh, that grinds to a halt. So, uh, yeah, so deleting rows don't work. Um, so why don't we just not do that? It's pretty obvious, right? Like when you think about it, go, well, then let's stop writing. Great. So let's not write anything to it. But we can't do that either because, again, uh, we've got eventual consistency. What if one of the other containers isn't sharding it? Or what if they're all sharding? And so we've all locked them all. And now we, get no we can't get any requests or any updates to metadata on the container level or any new objects. Any new objects will sit down in async pending, well, sit down in the objects and eventually get up. It's not good. Uh, but that's still not good because metadata won't get in there. What's even worse is what if we have a, one of the primary nodes that has uh, some rows in it that none of the other primary nodes have, and then that disk dies. Then suddenly we lost data, and we don't want that either. So we need to write data to these, to these databases. But we don't want to write data to these databases, so we're in a bit of a conundrum. Um, so the obviously way is to have a second database. So what we do is we have a container database. This is the one that we... This is kind of, this is what we have when he's too big and yucky and we, can't, we don't want to write it to anymore. So we lock him, we create a second database alongside, uh, which is obviously a bit of a change to, to Swift because our brokers need to change and grow some new smarts about knowing about different containers. Um, the, this guy can now hold all the metadata. He can, he, so he can still accept new metadata from, um, from users. Uh, we can still, he, had, he will hold the references to all the things we're sharding anyway. And we also get a holding table. I'm calling it a holding table because obviously objects are not going to live there forever. They're just receiving objects temporarily. And then the sharding daemon that does the sharding actually moves them, what I call misplaced objects, to the shards that they live in. So it's kind of a holding table. So now in this situation, if we have one primary node, uh, well, yeah, one primary node who is sharding and another primary node who hasn't started sharding yet, but he has objects, he obviously can talk and the pivot DB there will actually hold the objects. And then once we've sharded and all complete, what's also really nice about it is we can just simply unlink the old container and we suddenly free up a whole bunch of space. So that actually works really well. And so obviously this seems like we have three now. We now have three states. We have the unsharded state, which most things are going to be in until they get too big. We've got the sharding state, which is a little bit more complicated because we've got two databases. And then we'll have the sharded state because he's still on your holding table. Now, as you can imagine, on a large container, we don't want to be in the uncharted state. That's the whole reason we're doing this thing. The sharding state gets really complicated, and I'll show you in a, in a, follow, in a slide soon. Um, so we really want to be, if we need a shard, we want to get from the uncharted state to the sharded state as quickly as possible. And so there's all these things we've added to this proof of concept to try and get there quick, like batching up, uh, scanning for pivot points and stuff. Um, anyway, that doesn't really explain it very well, so I've got my awesome pretty diagrams. So now there's a bit of a change to the way I'm diagramming. So now that you see that awesome arrow, the V thing that's coming in and out, think of that as updates to that database or to the, the dealing with requests in a way. Um, so at the moment, in an uncharted, uh, uncharted database, we obviously have, it's dealing with all the load. Usually when you've got a large database, it's large because it's a very popular database too. A lot of people are writing to it. So there's a lot of load on this database too. Um, what will happen is the sharding daemon, which uh, is a, obviously a new thing to Swift from the, the patch that I'll provide. Um, he lives on 
all the container servers and, they, they, and the, it scans through sharded disks to see if they need to be sharded or whatnot, or shrunk or whatever. Um, so the, sharder, the sharding demon will come along, it will find this guy, he needs to be sharded. Uh, so he'll do some group election, very basic stuff uh, amongst the primary nodes to find out who is the scanner node, because we don't want them all scanning for pivot points to start sharding on, because again, we want to get there quick and we still want to deal with load. So we still want the other two or three, or depending on your replication guys, to deal with stuff. Um, so we find one pivot scanner, and he will scan for batches again to get as quickly as we can. Um, so it kind of looks like this. A little bit more complicated, I'm sorry, it's a big jump. But in this case, the scanner node has started scanning, and he's found cat, giraffe, and igloo. Because again, they're the first names that came to head in my head. So they're, they're the pivots for that container at this point. Um, they're red because they've been found, but they haven't been sharded. But what we also do is, as soon as the scanner node has found pivots, we go and create the shards uh, for them. So these shards down here, none to cat, catch giraffe, and draft to igloo, are zero, uh, empty, not empty, but you know, they're empty containers when they, we first create them. Uh, first empty databases, whatever. Um, so now they're, ta but they're taking the load straight away. So now, as you can imagine, a lot less of the load, depending on how far through the batch has gone, how many things, how many um, pivots we found, all that load is now taken off that big container, and it's also being dealt with. All the updates are now going into our pivot DB, which is nice and small. Still could be very busy, so we can still be filling up quite quickly, but as we find more pivot points, the load gets less and less and less, so it's actually kind of healthy. Um, the next one comes along, so now one of the other, so we have a, one of the primary nodes is now doing the scanning, and we've got the other primary nodes who, when they come around, on the, the daemon comes around on one of their servers, because, hey, you need to shard your container. But you're not the scanner node. So you can start shard, if we've got pivots defined in the database, you can start scanning them. I mean, you can start sharding them. And that's what this represents. So the first, that, so this, um, so now this sharding daemon has gone, OK, I'm going to start pivoting on none or everything below cat. And so what he does is it creates an empty container in a handoff location on the same server, because we obviously don't want to. We want to do it locally. And then we grab all the data that's in this kind of, all the stale data in the read-only database, and we put him in that container, in that database. Um, that's obviously stale, but it's also probably 99% of the actual objects we need, because whatever. And then we go to look in the holding table, we update that database, and then we can push it down. And we push it down using Swift replication. I'm not going to go into it. It doesn't really matter. All you have to really worry about is it'll push it down to the node, and then we'll, again, we'll do this coalescing of the databases. So we've now got a nice state. Uh, we mark it, it as sharded, as you'll see why later. Um, and we can continue on. And that's what the next slide kind of example, the example. So now it's sharding the next one. But I also wanted to point out that now we've got a Linux pivot point. So the, the scanner node is continually doing it. And this is the advantage of having a bunch of nodes doing it at once. Uh, anyway, this would continue on until we obviously get to the end, and we'll get something nice and pretty, right? So now there's no real load or updates happening on the root container. In essence, there is a very, very slight, because the root container, we've got still storing all the container met the metadata that the users do, because we don't want to replicate that everywhere. Um, and it still gets updates to its references for the shards I'm below, because we have, I've obviously worked through sharding the root container. But as these shards get too big, we obviously shard them the exact same way, except we just go update the root container for the references. OK, so that's kind of update requests. That's like putting an object, uh, deleting an object, updating metadata. That's kind of what that stuff does. Where it gets a bit more confusing is when we do a get. So a get to a container server retains, returns that object list. And in this case, uh, it gets more complicated, especially when you're in the, uh, the sharding and sharded state. The sharded state's really easy. So we'll start with that one. So a request will come in, and the root container will have references to where it needs to go. And so obviously, this request is asking for stuff, something before giraffe and after giraffe. In Swift, there is an a object or container listing limit, um, so we don't get too much data at once, and then you have to paginate if you need any more than that. So we're never dealing with huge amounts. By default, it's 10,000. Um, 
So what this means is the request is sometime somewhere between before draft and after draft. And of course, we're just going to look at one, send the request off to one shard, get the results, the other shard, get the results, kind of merge them together and send it back. So kind of simple. It's good and it works quite well. Um, when we're on the sharded state, it gets a little bit more complicated. And I've made it even simpler because now I'm not polling two different shards. I'm only one, because otherwise there'll be too many arrows and it'll be very confusing. So in this case, a request comes in. We then have to go look at the delete the, the locked uh, stale data for the response. We then need to look at the holding table. Then we need to go down to shard, because he's now re he's been receiving uh, ingress changes as things have been happening. And then we have to merge the three together. Um, and it gets a little bit more complicated. It gets, it gets kind of complicated. It's not too bad, but still, we're reading this really large container, and we don't really want that. Uh, in this case, if it was different, if we were trying, if a request came in and it was asking for something, I don't know, less something less than draft there, it's actually really easy because we just go, you just talk to the shard, they know all about it, good, send it home. So it's only this one state, but it gets easier and easier the more we shard. So the load again gets lighter and lighter. So it actually works quite well. Um, so now I've got some graphs. Uh, so doing the code, that wasn't too bad, but doing benchmarks has been a, has a bit of a pain in the, um, I I'm not allowed to swear, am I? So pain in the, the foot. foot. Yeah, well, that's good. I do have a pain in the foot, so that's, that works. Um, so like I said, I work for Rackspace, and so I've been trying to benchmark in the Rackspace public cloud. Uh, if you know anything about the Rackspace public cloud, it's multi-tenanted. So that's not very useful if you're on a, because you know, you're dealing, you're dealing, you're sharing hardware. Um, so anyway, so, uh, so you'll find that I, I, and some of these benchmarks take a long time to do. And if something happens in the cloud, like we lose some, intermittently lose some software networking, then it, it graphs will get ruined. And you're like, ah, oh, not again, my pretty graphs. So uh, yeah. So in this example, we have three, they're showing three graphs here. The top one is just, all the sharding stuff going on. The second one and third one, they're two clusters. So I've got these two small clusters in the cloud. Um, one of them, the bottom one is, in this case is a sharded container. It's got sharding turned on. And the one above, it doesn't. Same code, same everything. Um, this is, the benchmark is used, uh, generated using SSBench. Um, and what it does, it starts at an, at, this benchmark starts at an empty cluster, uh, creates a container. Uh, so this suspension is running twice, obviously. So it creates an empty container. On one of them, it's sharded. On one of them, it's marked not as sharded. And then it just has a very high put uh, kind of benchmark load. So we're really, we're really pushing the load on all these servers. In fact, they don't really handle it very well, which is great, because this is what we want to see. Um, it run, this runs for about 24 hours, is what you're seeing here. Um, you can't really take numbers into account because for some reason, cluster two just must be where it is in the cloud is always a little bit slower. So between benchmarks, I always had to flip them, which is fine. That's always good practice to do anyway. Um, but what we're looking at is a general, is, is just the general kind of pattern. So you can see all these peaks on cluster two. They correspond with every time I'm sharding, which kind of makes sense. Like if there's a very heavy load coming in, which is really more than the cluster could probably handle, Every time I'm kind of playing with the databases, of course, it's going to be a bit more latency. Uh, but it actually gets easier. You can't really see it here. It actually gets less and less. You can see it up the top there being less uh, shards, too. Um, you also got to take into account that the cloud is a bit noisy. Um, but anno so we're seeing smooth. I haven't, so in other words, I'm saying I haven't broken anything, which is a really good start. Like, it would be bad if I did all this test and then it didn't work. And I'd be like, uh -huh, uh. Uh, So instead, it, it hasn't broken anything. So I went, OK. Great, I haven't broken anything, but what I want to see is I want to see the um, non sharded container latency. This is latency, so the higher the, the worse, it's worse. So I want to see whatever one is a non sharded container to start doing you know, that nice pattern up as it's getting worse and worse. And it's actually great to find that number because then we can tune uh, when to shard. So I thought, okay, I've got, to change the, I've got to change the scenario. So now this is a different one. Uh, this time it's flipped. So this time, cluster one is a sharded one, and cluster two, because I, like, I always flip them. And um, this scenario is a little bit different, this benchmark. So now, in the last one, we've got to about 10 million objects, and we now haven't found any real problems yet. Um, so maybe I shouldn't be sharding so 
quickly because obviously 10 million objects hasn't seemed to affect anything. And these aren't great disks in the cloud either, so they're actually behaving really well. Um, I'm really impressed with SQLite, actually. This one, uh, SSBench allows you to initialize the cluster before you run your benchmark. So this is initializing it with 10 million and then running the benchmark for 24 hours. And um, it worked pretty well. Um, you can see it's getting a bit noisy. The last one is probably a lot quieter because that was over Christmas, and obviously no one does any work in the cloud at Christmas time. And this is kind of everyone's come back to work. And so it's a little bit more jittery. Um, but we're, I, I, I see, I don't, maybe I'm blind because I want to see what I want to see. But the bottom one is starting to finally, very slowly, but starting to do that uh, kind of progression up, which is awesome. But again, it means I haven't run the benchmark long enough. The longer I run a benchmark, the more time I let the public cloud screw up my results. Um, so unfortunately, I could show you a copy of the current running benchmark, but it's gone all crazy for a whole day on one of them. Um, so unfortunately, I was hoping to have the slide, but I don't have it. So that's why I'm going to have to end it. <laughs> but I promise you, it's working. In fact, what I'll do is once I actually get the next good slide, uh, the next good, some good graphs again of actually getting, finding that point of where it starts being a really bad idea to use a single container, I'll put it on my blog. Um, I put some notes on my blog already if anyone wants to read it. Um, but actually, this is good. The fact that it's still, after all this benchmarking, we're only just seeing stuff means we'll shard less and we'll know exactly how to tune the Swift cluster to, um, you know, for, so when it does get into Swift, it won't be obviously as shardy or as noisy as this guy. Look how many times he's sharding and doesn't need to, obviously, because it's a pretty good load. And that's a very high load. Anyway, any questions? Any questions? Oh, yes. Can you just stand up and ask your question, please? Given how many problems you've had with SQLite, uh, is that still the best technology choice for your that indexing? That's a great question. Um, there are lots of other, I shouldn't really say SQL-like, SQL-like SQL -like, like things out there, like RocksDB and or whatever, all these other ones. One of the problems is, is so far, SQLite's done a really good job. And in fact, proving it's actually doing a lot better than I expected to do uh, now. But our main problem is we want to support all these really big clusters out there right now who are using SQLite. So although Maybe sometime down the track, finding a better one might be a good solution. And maybe we should do some proof of concepts to see if there are better ones. I'm all for that. But I want to support the large cluster we have already out there who are experiencing these problems. So SQLite solving is kind of the first step. So if you've already sharded uh, a container, and then you get another 10 million random objects coming in, mm -hmm. How do you handle that? And also, if you had another 10 million objects coming in that were all named the same, or you know, similar, <laughs> as in? Yeah, so what will happen is I've, I've tried to keep, I've kept it fairly simple, I guess. So I've only showed sharding the, that root container, that first container, kind of the first pass, the initial shard. Um, any new, uh, if you've got a, uh, 10 million more objects coming in, they will go to wherever the shards they need to be. So they'll start filling up the shard containers. If they're all named fairly similar, it'll all probably start going into the one shard, but then we just shard that exactly the same way. So we start sharding shards. Um, the only difference there is we don't keep the... In the first one, we're actually keeping the root container, like the second container in the root container, because he's the root container and he needs to exist. But when we're sharding a shard, we only care about the new shards because all the objects will be gone from them and we can remove the old one. We could probably enhance it and still keep a bit of it, but whatever. In essence, we keep sharding, infinitely sharding. Anyone else? I'm sure Matt's going to be around for the rest of the week, are you? I'll be that guy hobbling around. Hobbling around, hobbling around. Just, just look for the cloud of rack space. You'll find him. <laughs> Right, thank Good you game. very much, Matt. On behalf of the LCA team, it's a little token of appreciation for your work and effort. Everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.